Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. Our guest today is Olga Stefanishina. She is Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration. She's with us uh, from Kiev, uh, the Ukrainian capital. Thank you very much. Hello, France. Your president, Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, claims that uh, some 6,000 square kilometers were won back by Ukrainian forces since the beginning of this month, especially in the Kharkiv uh, region. So a very simple but crucial question, are we seeing the turning point of this war? Uh, indeed, and um, uh, it's not only the turning point of the full-scale war, which started on uh, 24th of February. It's the turning point of the war, which started in spring uh, of 2014. It makes clear to Russian Federation that no concessions or any other format of semi-arrangements is acceptable to uh, those country which invaded its territory, killed its citizens, and has neo-imperial ambitions over uh, other countries. So, indeed, we are grateful for all the military support we managed to gain to strengthen our defense capacity, but also weaken Russia's economy and make sure that deoccupation the whole world sees right now is possible. Right. Uh, do you fear a uh, Russian retaliation. Uh, Russia says it's not withdrawing, it is regrouping. We saw already strikes on uh, the electricity infrastructure in the Kharkiv uh, region, but some are fearing that there might be worse, maybe strike on the Zaporizhia nuclear plant or even the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, well, indeed, what I can confirm is that basically Russia has the most severe enemy um, uh, as, as Ukraine. And this is uh, so because we know Russians better than anybody else. And whenever we are preparing for something, we are preparing for the worst case scenario. But so far, not, none of the threats by Russian Federation has been significantly surprising uh, or even surprising in a positive way. So, of course, we were prepared and expecting that Russia could probably attack the critical infrastructure before the beginning of the winter season. So uh, it has not caught us without surprise, but it should not be a surprise for the whole world to see that the terroristic states is again, without being able to get the military, so military victory, forces the civilians to suffer. So uh, you really think uh, that uh, for Russia, uh, it is uh, the beginning of the end in Ukraine and that uh, what is happening on the ground, uh, the Russian people, uh, not only the government or the military, are beginning to realize this? Uh, well, uh, it has been clear that the end of, uh, of the Russian, uh, Russian, let's say, a neo-imperialistic uh, agenda has finally started on 24th of February, but I'm sure that now the full understanding comes back to Moscow uh, itself. Uh, without, regardless, any ambitions the Kremlin might have, they are exhausted with their resources, they are stick, uh, uh, stick and tightened with the sanctions, and whatever they do in a gas manipulation only serves the agenda for bigger restrictions because Russia has now shown the whole world that they are not a reliable partner, that they cannot uh, ensure the security of uh, supplies and the security of people in Europe and around the world. So they are killing themselves and Ukrainian armed forces are helping them with that. Right. Uh, so uh, there were, uh, a few months ago, negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. They went uh, nowhere. Have the Russians in recent days, uh, seeing what they're seeing on the ground, conveyed to you that they wanted to sit down again and discuss or not at all? Uh, indeed, there's been sort of a public and non-public uh, outreach from various um, various um, groups of the, of the Russian officials. So, uh, and uh, it's clear that Ukraine has never 
stepped back from the negotiations. But given the gravity of the crimes Russia commits on our soil, which is getting more and more serious with every month, the leverage for negotiations is far from being the one uh, in uh, February. So uh, it is absolutely essential that we use this momentum uh, for the massive deoccupation of our territory, and then, of course, we will be ready for negotiations, not based on the Russian ultimatums, but on something that would allow to end the war, but also to avoid the next war on our soil, when Russia will be able to restore its reserves. Right. Uh, so, uh, just to make clear, I, I understand. So, some Russian officials have signaled Ukraine uh, since uh, the counterattack uh, that they want to sit down and discuss. But for now, what you're saying, uh, well, we have to see uh, where the military uh, battles bring us and then we discuss, correct? Uh, indeed. So uh, we should not only speak about the negotiations itself, but the purpose of the treaty from the Russian Federation. They want to... Um, uh, let's say, put our attention away and stop something which has been strategically planned for a month before. This is not the scenario we're going to play. And in fact, Ukraine remains the only country which now shapes up the rules of part of Russian Federation in the global agenda, but also in the agenda of the, um, uh, of the military situation in Ukraine. So we hope that together with, the, uh, with our partners, we will withstand, implement our strategic military, but also diplomatic agenda, and we'll be ready for negotiations when the moment will be appropriate to Ukraine. Right. Uh, so uh, it seems now that uh, your goal, uh, more than ever, I should say, is the return to the 1991 borders, meaning uh, that uh, Donbass uh, would be uh, Ukrainian again, Crimea would be uh, Ukrainian again, and that you're not going to stop militarily until you get there, correct? Well, uh, Donbass and Crimea are Ukrainian and have always been there. Uh, and in fact, since the beginning of the full-scale war, it's not already a disputable area. It's, all, it's just the same occupied area as it was occupied uh, with the Kiev, with Chernigiv or other regions. So uh, no special application in the military context should be applied here. But for us, it's really important that um, uh, that uh, we have uh, been uh, uh, a very coordinatedly um, planning our military operations, and we have a sustainable and coordinated process of providing military assistance to Ukraine. So we're not living in a format of 24 hours. So, and we have some strategies and plans for the months ahead. And we need to implement them. And upon that, we will look for the appropriate moment for any discussions with Russia, if they might be needed at this stage. Right. Your president uh, also called for more sanction. He called from, uh, for a new European Union sanctions package. This would be uh, the eight. But obviously, uh, with the soaring gas and electric prices in Europe, uh, do you think that this is uh, likely uh, to happen or uh, that there is opposition in several European countries to a new package? Well, what we hear from the capitals and from the Brussels, that the, uh, the ultimate goal of imposing um, uh, package after package sanctions is preserving the unity. While preserving this unity and managing to seek for the mu uh, mutually arranged package of sanctions does not always lead to the effect of the restrictiveness of measures needed to be taken. So we call upon European leaders to finally recognize the fact that the gas and energy resources are the major instrument of weakness of Russian Federation uh, and uh, weakness of European countries and the major source of Russian instruments of blackmailing. So this is the area from which most of the military operations has been sponsored. So sanctions should remain strong and cover the most vulnerable areas of the Russian Federation, which is gas. And in fact, uh, there's no other scenario because uh, Russia has already stopped um, supplying gas to European capitals. And uh, this is not something that might be tolerated. And I hope that the leaders would find solution. And tomorrow in the address to European Union, leaders of EU would uh, be strong and severe in that regard.
Just as, as a last question, uh, you're in charge of uh, European and Euro-Atlantic integration. Uh, do you think uh, that Ukraine, having resisted the initial onslaught on Kiev, now seemingly, uh, let's uh, remain cautious, but turning the tide, uh, that this uh, shows that uh, you are indeed a real uh, candidate for EU and NATO integration in the not-so-distant future? Uh, we are more than a real candidate, and it's already confirmed by the signature of the 27 leaders of, uh, of European nations. But uh, indeed, not all of the politicians, ministers and leaders could grab the gun and go on a far prone. But we managed to preserve the full operativeness and governance in all of the administrations. And we have the full commitment and we show it by our actions that we deliver on the reforms agenda in the times of the full-scale war. And this has been seen and this has provided our way towards membership in European Union. Olga Stefanishina, I want to thank you very much for appearing here on the France 24 interview from Kiev, the Ukrainian capital. Thank you all for watching this edition of the interview. Stay tuned for more news.